You're listening to Retire Y'all Charleston with Adam Curran. Adam is founder and CFP of Curran Financial Partners. He literally wrote the book on retiring in the Palmetto State. Retire Y'all, your guide to retiring in South Carolina. This is Retire Y'all Charleston. Okay, I'm going to do a new podcast format that we call Client Calls. And just as the name would hint at, I kind of got the same question asked over and over and over again um, by multiple people. And I said, what better content for me to discuss on the podcast than these, these questions that some of you probably had, but you just never voiced them to us or never dropped us an email. Um, but typically, if five or six people ask the same question, that means it's heavy on the minds and hearts of lots of other individuals who we plan with. So the first topic I want to discuss is, I think Wall Street Journal did an article on how to make 7% without taking any risk. And what they were hinting at was I-bonds, or Treasury Inflation Protected Securities, and which, which are pretty darn similar in their construct. Um, I-bonds, you need to buy directly through... Uh, the Treasury Direct, the, the website in which that the government has set up for people to buy bonds. And, and these aren't your grandma's bonds. Remember back in the day, grandma would pay, give you a $10 uh, Treasury bond with your birthday card. Um, I guess they're kind of like your grandma's bonds, but now you own them digitally. And I-bonds in particular, what we're going to go into pay interest based on inflation. And as you've witnessed over the last couple of years, we've had some what I would call not transitory inflation, real inflation starting to take root, and the numbers started to uh, really demonstrate themselves uh, at the end of 2021. So I-bonds must be bought through the government via Treasury Direct. They only let you buy $10,000 per year. If you're married, husband, and wife, you can each buy $10,000, so you can put $20,000. So if you have a substantial portfolio and you're trying to diversify and buy I-bonds, you're somewhat limited as to how much money you can put in these. So most financial planners, most people who manage money, uh, are using Treasury Inflation Protected Securities instead, or TIPS. Now, uh, just like when you buy individual bonds or you buy a bond fund or an ETF, it's, it's generally advantageous to buy individual bonds, and the reason being is because you have a set maturity date. So you know with absolute certainty at a certain point in time, you are going to get your initial deposit uh, back so long as the government doesn't default on debt, which is a highly, highly unlikely probability. I would say it's a 0% probability, but if you've been following the news the last decade, uh, all of a sudden, like, you know, rating agencies are no longer giving the U.S. debt AAA ratings. Um, so, so it's very highly unlikely, and truthfully, if the government ever were to default on their debt, uh, we would be in for a world of hurt. So I don't even like to uh, pessimistically pontificate on the government defaulting on its debt. And it's really the gold standard for stability. So if you think the government's going to default on their debt, well, then banks are going to start you know, having runs on them. And insurance companies uh, whose general funds are, are widely compiled of government treasuries and government bonds, they're going to start defaulting. So imagine a world where banks and insurance companies and the government is welching on their debt. Uh, it would be pretty catastrophic, to say the least. So um, of course, I went down the rabbit hole of governments defaulting on their debt. But... Treasury Inflation Protected Securities, or I-bonds, are government-issued bonds, and they'll typically have a, a set coupon or a set interest rate. Now, as of late, because interest rates are so low, that number's been zero. So literally, you make nothing on this bond. However, they'll pay you an interest based on what happened with the Consumer Price Index, or CPI, okay? So as you've witnessed, all of you Social Security recipients... You've gotten COLA adjustments. Well, TIPS, or Treasury Inflation Protected Securities, will pay you interest that's comparable to what your COLA adjustment was for Social Security. Okay, so this past year, we had I-bonds paying 7% interest. So the Wall Street Journal puts out a sexy article with a nice cover that says how to make 7% without taking any risk. 
And it's true. It's accurate. If you think the inflationary environment that we are in the midst of is not just transitory, it's here to stay, Treasury Inflation Protected Securities, I-bonds, might be a wonderful place to put a portion of your money. We use them. And in fact, if you're going to buy bonds right now, my advice to you would be buy bonds that have some sort of inflation link to them or floating rate notes. Bonds that are not going to be too um, beat up by rising interest rates. We've already heard that you know the Federal Reserve is going to raise interest rates probably, my guess, three, four times. Bank of America told them to raise them seven times. But probably three, four times this year, they'll raise interest rates. And if you just own regular old traditional bonds, you're going to lose principal based off of interest rates dropping, right? Especially if it's in an ETF or a mutual fund chassis. So if you're going to own bonds, own high yield bonds, own bonds that are going to adjust based on inflation. Tips and I bonds are a wonderful place. Now, here's the cons with them. One, you can only buy 10000 if you buy an I bond. Uh, if you buy tips, you could buy as much as you want, especially if you buy it in an ETF chassis. But the downside is is how the government calculates CPI these days. Back in the early 80s, if we use the same calculation for calculating inflation today that we used back in the early 80s, the inflation rate in 2021 would have been more to the tune of like 15 or 16 percent. Right? The government came out and said it's like five or six. That's because the CPI equation has been messed with, right? It's now called chained urban linked CPI. Chained, meaning if beef gets expensive, well, you'll just eat chicken. And if wheat gets expensive, well, you won't eat wheat, you'll use grain. Urban, meaning we all ride bikes to work like we're in Holland and none of us have automobiles, none of us have to fuel those automobiles, um, where truthfully, a lot of the inflation has, has occurred. If you look at the price of gasoline, you look at the price of vehicles, um, there's semiconductor microchip manufacturer shortages, so the cars are, are more expensive than they've ever been before. So all of that stuff has been booted out. And then if any component of CPI kind of grows a wild hair and, and, and jumps up in price, well, they'll just link it to something else. In short, what they're doing is manipulating what real inflation is. They're manipulating it because if they allowed inflation to take root the way it did in the late 70s and early 80s, the Social Security Trust Fund would be against the ropes even more than it already is. If you actually have taken some time, they used to send you a Social Security statement in the mail every year on your birthday. They stopped doing that. Um, they stopped doing that about, I don't know, seven years ago as part of their cost-cutting initiatives. So it's a program that between you and your employer, you've put in 12% of your pay into the program, and they saw fit to stop sending you a statement letting you know how that's coming along. Uh, as part of their cost-cutting initiatives. It's a real slap in the face, if you ask me. But if you actually read those little green statements, you can still get them on ssa.gov. If you actually read those green statements, um, it says, bold, front and cover, the Social Security Trust Fund is against the ropes, and by the year, I forget what it is, 2040 or something like that, it's going to be exhausted. Well, can you imagine how much quicker that fund would be exhausted or how much more against the ropes that fund would be exhausted if all Social Security recipients received a 15% cost of living adjustment this past year. So call me a tin hat wearing bunker dwelling conspiracy theorist, but one of the things I don't like about tips and I bonds and why I wouldn't bet the farm on them is because this past year was quite an anomaly with the level of inflation. Like we've had a higher year of inflation than we've had in the last 40 years in 2021. And I think it it the government and the treasury and all of the bean counters of of um our our federal government and um they don't want to see CPI reflective of real inflation because it would lend itself to the Social Security Trust Fund getting exhausted. 
Uh, heck, it would just make them look bad. And, you know, if there's anything we can count on our politicians to do is do whatever it takes to get reelected and look good in front of a camera. Um, so, so there's like, you got to look at it from an incentivization structure. Unfortunately, I don't think all of these, uh, federal reserve and, and, and sec uh, uh, treasury economists, uh, are truly there to properly gauge economic indicators. I think that there's, uh, there's an incentivization structure there for them to, um, make it look as though they're doing a better job than when they are. Call me a pessimist, but that's what I believe. Um, and when they started fiddling with CPI, bon I bonds and tips became way less attractive to me. We still utilize them within our portfolios. If you're working with our firm uh, and you reach out to our office because you read that Wall Street Journal article like many of you did, I immediately fixed your eye on the fact that you owned tens of thousands of dollars or hundreds of thousands of dollars in some cases of tips uh, and why we believed in them. Um, but we like I bonds, we like tips. Uh, just go into them eyes wide open, knowing that 2021 was quite an anomaly. I don't think you're going to be making 7% on tips in a systematic way year after year after year. Might you have a couple years where you get a good pop like you did this past year? Sure. Um, but truthfully, when you're investing in a tip, my target rate of return with something like that is, is more, think more to the tune of 2, 3, 4%. And if you can make two, three, four percent with principal protection, that might garner um, some attention for a portion of your portfolio. If you want to have some safety mechanisms built in there that'll help smooth out the ride, that's how we use them at least. But we were pleasantly surprised that all of our clients who own tips had a real good year in 2021. Now, people who own stocks had a real good year as well, um, but people who own tips certainly owned a heck, uh, made a a significantly better rate of return than people who just owned regular old traditional bonds that were yielding 2% or something like that. All right. So that's the, the, the client conversation I've been having about tips and I-bonds. I also had a, a handful of people who've hired us this year um, with substantial holdings in municipal bonds. So I've been having lots of conversations about muni bonds. And... Um, Here's my take on muni bonds. 20, 30 years ago, it would have been sacrilege to warn people of municipal bond default. Like muni bonds were on the same plane as government debt, even though they don't have the ability to print money, which is an important comp component of muni bonds, right? If the government starts to default, they'll just print money or they'll borrow it from the treasury. It'll, you know, cook their books so they're able to, to satisfy their debt obligations. Municipalities don't have the ability to do that. So, but nonetheless, people looked at municipal bonds as an absolute pillar of stability, a safe haven. Well, over the course of the last decade, we've now seen multiple municipalities default on their debt. I think Hershey, Pennsylvania, Scranton, Pennsylvania, Sacramento, California. There's a bunch of places in Illinois that were, were, were defaulting, I believe. There's been multiple municipalities that have welched on their debt. So we need to acknowledge the fact that municip municipalities are not as safe as they once were. The CARES Act during COVID, right, in April of, of 2020, there was a number of municipalities that were already against the ropes. In fact, if you looked at their credit worthiness or their credit ratings, they were starting to tinker around junk territory, meaning they were like triple B below um, from a ratings agency. As much as you trust the rating agencies, they've been wrong time and time again, decade after decade, but, you know, we, we got to put some level of faith in them, I hope. Um, so some municipalities were starting to have really, really low credit ratings. And the yield you were fetching on these muni bonds was still like 2 3 4%. Now, granted, the attractive thing about muni bonds is they are, they are triple tax free, right? So you don't pay state tax, you don't pay municipal tax, you don't pay federal tax. So if you look, if you're in a 25% tax bracket, 
and you got a bond yielding 4%, the taxable equivalent yield on that is 5%, right? Because you, uh, if it was a normal bond, 25% of it would pay tax on it, but this, in this case, you don't pay that. So basic math here for all the accountants that are watching this. Um, so, so in my opinion, in order to make 3 4%, not in my opinion, factually, you were generally doing business with a municipality that was against the ropes. So we were warning people, steer clear of these municipal bonds that still yet have pretty high ratings because you're not being rewarded properly for the risk that you're taking. Because the ratings, in my opinion, weren't in line with the level of risk that you're actually taking. A lot of these municipalities were against the ropes. Think these municipalities where a lot of people uh, were fleeing, right? Well, COVID hits, and one of the biggest components of the CARES Act, that was a $2 trillion spending bill, was to bail out a lot of the municipalities and cities that were against the ropes, right? And, and go figure, most of these municipalities were left-leaning places, cities, New York City and Chicago. and um, So a lot of people, when I looked at the CARES Act and how the money was distributed and, um, and then further, you know, stimulus acts, it, it, it just seemed to me that it was um, us bailing out a lot of municipalities that we're probably going to fall on hard times in very short order. Now, these municipalities have been infused with cash. So if you're a day trader, I would buy muni bonds feeling pretty good because they've been infused with cash. They've got a little war chest of, of liquidity. So they're probably not going to default on the short term. Now, think of what's been happening demographically in a lot of those municipalities that were against the ropes, New York and Chicago, the great migration. People are leaving cities and moving to Charleston and moving to Austin, Texas, and, and coming down south. Well, do you think that the city of New York just immediately um, you know, slashed all their budgets with an ax based off of... Uh, the, the, the migration of a bunch of yuppies who are leaving the city because they got to work from home? No, like expenses are kind of sticky, especially bureaucratic expenses. Like they're not good at being nimble in slashing their budget. Like it's trying to like uh, course correct a huge oil tanker. It takes miles in order to change its trajectory. You can't just like take a left turn like you're on a speedboat. So... In the short term, I think a lot of municipalities have been infused with cash, so we're not going to see a lot of default. But this demographic shift of people leaving cities and this demographic shift of, of municipalities that are bureaucratic and run like terrible lemonade stands, they're not going to be able to quickly and nimbly and thoughtfully adjust their budgets so I don't like muni bonds. I, I think it's it's I, I get why people advocate for them if you've got lots of non qualified money and you want to have a, a low tax profile, if uh, if you make a huge income and you want to earn tax free interest, that, that's the, 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 the pros of municipal bonds. The cons are is you're lending money to poorly run institutions and they have credit ratings that are overinflated. Like I'd rather lend money to a thoughtful, nimble business that can very quickly lay off 25% of its workforce if they fall on hard times. Do you think the city of Sacramento is going to be able to lay off 25% of its workforce if they fall on hard times? No, there's going to be like a labor lawyer coming in and, you know, you know, you need to pay their pension benefits. And it's, it's, it's a clunky hard group of people to manage too. Like there's, there's robust, granted their, their salaries are on the lower end, but they give up salary so they can get robust, uh, benefits, health insurance, pensions, and, um, 
you know, severance packages and maternity leave and paternity leave, all this stuff. So um, unionized in many cases. So I, I don't like muni bonds. Now, granted, so what we did with a lot of the clients who work with us who have muni bonds, what we did was we kind of just thoughtfully went through them. I never just want to sell everything. And in, in many cases, some of these people, because interest rates have gone down, they had um, their bonds were trading at a at a at a um, at, at, with a capital gain baked into them. So um, at a premium, is the word I was looking for, not a discount. Uh, so if we sold them, they'd have a bunch of capital gains taxes they had to pay. So we just kind of thoughtfully went through the muni bonds. We looked at the ones that were yielding right. We looked at the bonds that had very short maturity. So bonds that were going to mature in the next four or five years. I'm not worried about default because of what happened during the CARES Act. I am worried about some of those muni bonds that had maturities that were like 10, 15 years because I'm not going to put it past these municipalities to be terrible with money, blow through their money, fall up on hard times again, and maybe next time they don't get bailed out. So what they do is they welch on their debt holders. And I got some news for you. Um, People like Elizabeth Warren, progressives are going to go, well, you're bailing out the millionaires and billionaires by, um, you know, not allowing this municipality to to default. Because guess what? Typically, people who own muni bonds are millionaires, right? That's why they own them. So it's going to be a very easy person to welch on, millionaires like you. So I I don't like the risk-reward demographics of muni bonds for all of the reasons I just laid out. So uh, what we did with these people is we went through them. We kept the muni bonds that were yielding right. We kept the muni bonds that had short durations, we were thoughtful about tax consequences for selling the muni bonds. Um, we didn't want to create all these huge capital gains, but we got rid of them by and large. The other problem with muni bonds is, is we're entering an inflationary environment. Muni bonds pay a fixed interest rate. I don't want to lend people money when inflation's running 7% per year. right? So we don't like owning bonds Hardly ever, but we certainly don't like owning bonds when the government's printing money like lunatics and inflation's taking root. So for all those reasons, we told these individuals to wean off of muni bonds. All right, what are some other things we talked about? Oh, the Great Reset. Should I go into the Great Reset? I'm kind of exhausted. I did like four radio shows on the Great Reset. Um, So the Great Reset is this concept that gained attention because there's this group called the World Economic Forum and like the the moderator guy of the World Economic Economic Forum is this guy named Klaus from Germany. He literally looks and talks like a Bond villain. Like look this guy up. Go Google World Economic Forum Klaus and look at the pictures of this guy. He is taken right out of a Bond movie and he's the evil guy and he talks evil and they talk about this concept of the Great Reset, kind of like Rahm Emanuel, never let a good tragedy go to waste. Like they're trying to use COVID as a way of changing capitalism for the benefit of humanity. And, and oddly enough, this, this, this zany looking villain has captured the hearts and minds of some of the most influential, important people in the world. Like at his at his World Economic Forum, he had the 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 what is the premier of China talk, like world leaders, um, major um, billionaires and deployers of capital, hedge fund managers are at this this conference. So naturally. The conspiracy theorists go, okay, what are all these people doing in a room? Why are they talking about the Great Reset? And how are they going to screw me? And there's some truth to all of this. There really, really is. Like, they talk about ESG, environmental, social, and governments investing, as one of the mechanisms that that the World Economic Forum is championing and uh, that's a component of the Great Reset. Because make no mistake about it, what the Great Reset lends itself to, and this is from Glenn Beck's mouth. Um, and Glenn Beck, I love the guy. I think he's a great entertainer. 
Um, but he's kind of a financial grifter. Like his two biggest advertisers are food storage and gold salespeople, right? And that's been the case for the last 10 years. So it's been like this never-ending warning of the world coming to an end. And betting on the end of the world is very rarely a profitable bet. And the Great Reset just kind of rolls off the tongue. You couple that with this villainous-looking guy at the head of it. And you couple that with all the world leaders in a room pontificating about how they need to change um, uh, capitalism and how they need to have like the new world order, a borderless world where everyone kind of plays nicely together, this utopian kind of progressive dream. And um, couple that with a bunch of people being trapped inside all day long, watching YouTube videos, freaking out because the government's telling them what to do left and right, Gustavo government and COVID restrictions and all that. And, and you've got the Great Reset. It's a perfect, you know, recipe for, for people to freak out about this. So what Glenn Beck says is he says that the World Economic Forum is, um, you know, this new world order group of individuals, and they're going to swallow up the big banks, they're going to swallow up the regional banks, and then the regional banks are going to reappropriate your assets, and then by the year 2031, you'll have no assets. And all the big asset managers, companies like BlackRock, who owns iShares, the largest, I think the largest holder of assets on the face of the earth. I mean, they hold like darn near 5% of all outstanding shares on the New York Stock Exchange uh, and all the exchanges for that matter, NASDAQ and everyone. Um, they, they are going to do ESG investing and, and they're going to play kingmaker and um, I can unpack ESG investing in one second. My rebuttal on that mindset, Glenn Beck's take on the Great Reset, is people will regularly go, oh, Donald Trump's an idiot. Oh, Joe Biden's lost his marbles. He's not even here. His handler's taking care of him. Or George Soros, he's an evil, devious dummy, and he's 80 years old. Like, like, people will call all of these world leaders megalomaniacs, fools, idiots, um, but then out of the left side of their mouth, they'll say, oh, Donald Trump's an idiot, but he's the orchestrator of this multifaceted, tiered, tranched uh, scheme to take all your assets away in eight years' time. So you're, you're, you're calling the person a fool, but then you're also granting them the privilege of thinking that they're so smart that they're able to orchestrate this incredibly technical, robust, um, they're the puppeteer of the global economy and they're going to take your assets away from you. I just don't believe it. Like, call me eternally optimistic. Like, and the other thing is, come and take it. How are you going to come and take my money from me? Like, you're going to take my assets from me? That's not happening. And then you've got millions of other people just like me looking at other people's money. Like, I have a hard time believing this group of megalomaniacs are going to redesign the global economy and reappropriate people's assets away from them. I think what's happening is most conspiracy theories can be thrown out the window, although it seems like all my conspiracy theory friends look awfully prophetic over the last few years during COVID. But most conspiracy theories can be thrown out the window if you just kind of boil them down to like the most simplistic reason they're all getting together. The most simplistic reason all these people are getting together is their status signaling, right? They're signaling that they're compassionate, right? That's currency today. You can do something completely idiotic, but hide behind the veil of I'm compassionate and all of a sudden like you're allowed to behave like a fool and I won't get too political with this but we see it all over the place now where um, logic has left the reservation and it's been replaced with kumbaya singing compassionate people and if you walk around being logical or trying to think through uh, touchy subjects which which isn't touchy now um you get cast aside as a you know a racist or a Nazi like you there's no nuance now it's like oh you don't agree with this you're a Nazi 
you're a racist. It's that quickly. Like, there's no, oh, he's kind of hard-headed, and he doesn't see the world through the same lens as me. No, you're, he's a racist, and he's a Nazi. That's it. Do not cross-go. Do not collect $200. You go straight to Nazi jail. There's, there's no um, nuance there at all. So anyways, I, I, I don't believe the Great Reset is going to cause uh, a massive economic end of the world. Uh, I think it's just sexy to talk about. I think it's uh, getting listeners on Glenn Beck's show. Um, now, ESG, Environmental, Social, and Governance Investing, this is something I've been warning about for like two years. And now Glenn, it's getting its time in the light again because Glenn Beck's talking about it. And, and Glenn Beck is just the litmus for numerous other um, conservative talk radio people. Okay, So um, ESG investing is, is a – in its most – Pure form. I'm gonna I'm gonna kind of pretend I'm a liberal who likes ESG investing for a little bit. It's a way in which companies can be scored on their environmental principles and their carbon footprint. And governmentally, do they play nice with their government? Are they doing business with warlords in Africa? Um, socially. Uh, do they offer good benefit packages and are they kind to their employees and give men three-month paternity leave? Um, like, are they good guys? Are they good neighbors in our humanity, in, in our society? Are they polluters? Are they, um, you know, crony capitalists who are doing all kinds of stuff behind the scenes with government? I don't even know how you're supposed to... There's laws that dictate that, but apparently the ESG gods have their own laws. And if you ask me, that's the problem with ESG investing right there. Who are these kingmakers assigning the scores, right? Because when I look at the scores, Coca-Cola has a comparable score to Tesla, right? So here's Coca-Cola, a company that makes a brown sugary drink that causes cancer. And then all those cans and bottles and little plastic, uh, rungs to make six packs that sea turtles are eating uh litter our world right and i got nothing against coke but but let's be this is here here's my esg score for for coke call me zany they make a brown sugary cancer causing drink and they're they litter humanity and they have the same esg score as tesla a company that's creating electric cars whose CEO's mission in the world is to sustainably populate Mars and also whose CEO runs SpaceX, which has figured out a way to um, shoot off rockets and then land them so the the space isn't just littered with rockets, um, who's also the owner of Solar City who I thought liberals love solar panels, uh, creating sustainable energy, not using fossil fuels. So I just have a hard time believing that the brown sugary drink company has the same ESG score as Tesla. Now, you go, well, why would that be? Well, one reason, if you follow Elon Musk on Twitter or you followed what he's been doing over the last few years, uh, he moved his plant out of California because he was tired of being told he needed to shut down during COVID. This guy has an audacious goal of populating Mars, and he cannot suffer Gavin Newsom um, shutting down his plant foolishly for months and months and months on end. So he said, I'm operating. Right? We're, we're taking all the necessary precautions. We're being careful. We're, we're going to take these measures. We can't just shut down my goal. You're going to close my company down. All of these people are going to lose their job. So, of course, he's since moved a lot of his operations to Austin. I think he still has some operations in California, but um, I know he's moving out of California, and a lot of liberals didn't like that. Right, They thought he was a murderer and he was uh, you know, running a 
Uh, as Elizabeth Warren says, you know, he was um, a hanger on of the federal government. He didn't pay his fair share in taxes, even though in 2020, it was, I think it was 2021, he's going to wind up paying $11 billion in taxes, the largest tax bill any American has ever paid ever. And oh, by the way, he's not American. He's South African. So he's an immigrant that we want to keep more of them here. So an immigrant is paying the largest tax bill in the history of America. And Elizabeth Warren has came out and said, if you think he should pay his fair share and he's a scum bucket, uh, give my campaign $50. All right. Here's an immigrant paying $11 billion in taxes. We should all golf clap that. But no, we don't want to do that. We want to vilify him because he's a billionaire. Oh, by the way, he's a billionaire that's trying to populate Mars. Like, he's trying to populate Mars. Bureaucrats, get out of the guy's darn way and let him go about populating Mars because you're going to need that guy when a big asteroid comes out of left field and it, you know, is at a path to destroy the Earth. That's his whole deal. Like, he believes... Humans should be interplanetary species. That way, if something happens on Earth, the popu- you know, our, 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 our species will continue to last and procreate because we'll be able to live on Mars for a little bit. Crazy thought to think. Now, why does Coca-Cola have such a good ESG score? Well, remember about two years ago, Coca-Cola felt the need to do a seminar for their employees on how to be less white. Right? Literally, we're going to gather, and I, I always think about this. I go, okay, so there was a meeting. Like Coca-Cola is a massive company, right? So there's got to be smart people there. And they had a meeting where they all sat around a table, and someone said, okay, uh, Tom, any good ideas that we should do to improve our culture? And Tom goes, yeah, um, been thinking, everyone. What if we did a presentation on how to be less white. And then a bunch of other people were like, good idea, Tom, run with that one. That's a good idea. Um, That won't be at all controversial. And I agree with you. I think our white employees need to be less white. So, of course, they did the how to be less white presentation and that got like, you know, someone whistle blew that. And you can look this up. You can literally Google Coca-Cola how to be less white seminar And you can watch this, um, and hopefully it'll train you to be less white. And go figure, Coca-Cola gets a little improvement in their ESG score for for the how to be less white. Here's the problem with ESG. Who the heck are these kingmakers assigning scores? Because it seems to me that the companies have the best ESG score are woke good boys. Like, they're beating to the sound of the liberal progressive drummers. So naturally, as a God-fearing, flag-waving conservative, I get a little bit triggered by that. I get fearful when the liberals are assigning scores to companies that are behaving wokely. And, And go figure now, Wall Street, what Wall Street is doing, guys like Larry Fink with iShares and BlackRock, Uh, Elizabeth Warren has also been outspoken about 401ks needing to have a higher ESG component in the stocks that you're able to invest in. Um, Wall Street is trying to, well, Wall Street, you know, it's, it's a marketing machine. Wall Street's selling people ESG stocks and charging more on them because there are a large group of individuals who, who don't see the world through the same lens as me. And they just think that ESG is a, uh, they're more trusting of governmental agencies, right? Um, maybe I'm spreading misinformation here, but there is a large segment of humanity that believe that Dr. Anthony Fauci has done a marvelous job of disseminating science throughout the pandemic, right? There's like probably 100 million people in this country who think Dr. Anthony Fauci belongs on Mount Rushmore. Um, count me out. I'm not one of those people. I think he's been wrong an awful lot. And um, anyways, there are people who think ESG gods are actually doing right by humanity by assigning these scores. Here's what I'm worried about. If, if 401ks, which 
when you look at public wealth are the largest chassis for public wealth, right? That that's where most people's money sits in 401ks. If 401ks had a a rule that you were only able to invest in companies that had high ESG scores, then you've got this board of ESG um, bureaucrats who go, okay, that person gets a good score, that person gets a bad score. They're kingmakers. They literally dictate which companies get the capital from 401k investment. So naturally, if you're not a good boy, if you don't play nicely with the bureaucrats, you're going to get a negative ESG score, a bad ESG score, and you're going to garner less 401k investment. In my opinion, and this is not just my opinion, it's what Elizabeth Warren is outspoken about, she wants 401k plans to look more like the government's thrift savings plan, or TSP. And TSP, if you're a government employee, you know you're only allowed to invest in like seven different funds. You've got the C fund, the S fund, the I fund, the L fund, um, G fund. So you have very limited investment options. Now, the the good thing about TSP is the funds are very inexpensive. Like your expense ratios are 0.03%. And that used to be like, oh, they're, they're cheap. Well, that ship has kind of sailed because you could get 0.03% expense ratios through Fidelity and Vanguard and Schwab and all these different custodians. Uh, heck, Fidelity's got a bunch of index funds that charge you nothing. There's zero expense ratio. So TSP can no longer say that you know they, they do this because they're cheap because you can get these funds everywhere. Um, but that's what they say. They go, oh, we give you seven funds, but we're really cheap and we don't want to give people lots of investments because if we give people lots of options, they'll do something stupid. And here are these case studies of these, these people who had lots of options and they invested foolishly and they lost all their money. Like they're always legislating to the dumbest person in the room. Here again, call me a tin hat wearing conservative, but my fear is if you only have seven mutual funds that you can invest in and go figure those mutual fund managers are an arm's length away from the ESG gods and they're an arm's length away from Washington, you're giving a tremendous amount of power to Washington to play kingmaker. So if you're on Washington's bad guy list, you can make one phone call to your ESG um, buddies and go, hey, um, you know XYZ company over there is um, funding my, uh, my c- competitor in the upcoming midterms. Or XYZ company over there is getting out of line and saying some stuff that I don't like. Any way in heck you can change their ESG score for me? Can we manufacture a crisis? Can we say that they're killing the yellow-bellied owl in Idaho? Or how about this? Hey, let me call up my TSP guys. You're the manager of the uh, large cap stock fund. And remember we want to put an ESG component on that large, stock, large cap stock fund. Uh, this company over here, um, by the looks of it, is not doing a very good job with their environmental and their governance score. So uh, can we kind of um, drop them down and consider taking them out of the large cap stock fund? Call me a conspiracy theorist, but like they're outspokenly saying this now. I think it's one of the most devious, malicious power grabs happening on the face of the earth. Like everyone's worried about wearing masks and stuff. All the while, in the dark of night, the government's trying to take control of the investments that you have access to in your 401k and in your thrift savings plan. So the ESG component of the Great Reset is very real. It's very scary. It's been happening for years and years and years. You might already see it happening within your 401k. You might start to see an ESG fund sneak in there. You might start to get letters from your 401k provider that say, we're going to uh, change your mutual fund lineup or we're going to remove some of the funds within your lineup. That's why what I believe, if the, f- the costs are right based off of your age, um, if you have the opportunity to roll your 401k to an IRA, obviously weigh all the pros and cons because there could be advantages of keeping money in the 401k. But many times I like rolling it to an IRA because it opens up the landscape of the investments that you have at your disposal 
and you don't have to play by the rules of your 401k provider or TSP, the government, uh, the seven mutual funds. Um, but that's my take on the Great Reset. Lastly, the last thing I'm going to cover, um, we had one of the worst Januaries in the stock market in the last 20 years. There's always a bull market. And one of the conversations I've been having with a lot of people is, Warren Buffett's got a great quote. He basically says, you only need to make you know, two or three good investments per year. And if you look back at the last few years, you look back at like the year 2020, uh, right after COVID, the airlines, the hotels, the restaurants, the regional banks, oil and gas, all that stuff dropped like 40, 50, 60%. And had you made put some money in those investments at their bottom, you would have received a tremendous rate of return that year. Last year, um, oil and gas, you know, was a wonderful place to put some money. Get the heck out of the, the, the pandemic names, things like Zoom and Peloton and things like that. This year, the way we've started the year off, a lot of those growth innovative names, like I think of Kathy Woods, who runs ARK Innovative, ticker ARKK. Um, this was Wall Street's darling in 2020 and in 2021. Like it, it, actually, 2021 wasn't a very good year, but it was Wall Street's darling for several years. She was outperforming the S&P 500. Well, she has taken it on the chin year to date. Like her ARK fund is down like 40%. So, a lot of people look at what she holds in ARC, Teladoc, Tesla, Spotify, um, disruptive technology, you know, Coinbase, Robinhood. Uh, so, crypto, uh, AI, um, 5G, um, you know, just things that are, you know, if you watch an episode of Star Trek, you'd go, you know, these are the companies that are creating the technology that, that, that will look like one day. So Kathy Wood's ARC fund is down darn near 40, 50%, depending on which minute you look at it. That tells me it's 40 to 50% safer than what it was at the end of 2021. Now, granted, it is in innovative, technological, risky names, but now those names are 50% safer. So even though you're investing in riskier investments, a lot of the risk has been cooked or baked out of them. So in my opinion, if you've got dry powder, now this is not, don't shift your entire portfolio into this, but if you've got dry powder, if you want to capitalize on what happened in January, I would look to those names. Look to the semiconductors. Look at a name like NVIDIA. NVIDIA was down like 20 30%. It's since popped up a little bit as I record this, but it's still on sale if you ask me. Look at Kathy Woods' ARC fund. It's down 40%. That might be a, a place where you shift some of your bonds, shift some of your cash, uh, and try to make a little bit of money in the heart of a, a crash in certain sectors. Now, the overall S&P, as I record this, is only down like 6 or 7%. That's not really bargain shopping. Sure, it's better than what it was a month ago, but you're not getting deep discounts down 6 or 7%. Um, but I look at ARC, and I look at some of these things that are down 40 50%, and Seems like a good time to buy them. So that's it. Those are the conversations I've been having most this month. Uh, I'm going to try to do this every month. If you've got some questions that you want to go over with me, um, please holler them out, and we will uh, cover them on this very podcast each and every month. Thanks for listening, guys. Investment advisory services offered through Current Financial Partners and SEC Registered Investment Advisor. Current Financial Partners is an independent financial services firm that helps people create retirement strategies using a variety of insurance and investment products. Investing involves risk, including the potential loss of principal. Any references to protection, safety, or lifetime income generally refer to fixed insurance products, never securities or investments. Insurance guarantees are backed by the financial strength and claims-paying abilities of the issuing carrier. This podcast is intended for informational purposes only. It is not intended to be used as the sole basis for financial decisions, nor should it be construed as advice designed to meet the particular needs of an individual's situation. Current Financial Partners is not permitted to offer and no statement made during this podcast shall constitute tax or legal advice. Our firm is not affiliated with or endorsed by the United States government or any governmental agency. 
The information and opinions contained herein provided by third parties have been obtained from sources believed to be reliable, but accuracy and completeness cannot be guaranteed by current financial partners.